Hey this is Sayyam Botani and you're listening to Chai Time Data Science a podcast for data science enthusiasts where i interview practitioners researchers and calculators about their journey experience and talk all things about data science Hello and welcome to another episode of the Chai Time Data Science Show. In this episode, I am really privileged to be interviewing one of the best statisticians and quite literally the author of the Grammar of Graphics, Dr. Leland Wilkinson, Chief Scientist at H2O.AI. In this episode, we talk all about Leland's journey into the field over the past few years, his amazing contributions that. i believe need no introduction to the audience his work at sys start s y s t a t for the audience that are unfamiliar with it followed by his work at tableau and his current work at h2o.ai where again he's working on very exciting projects we talk all about how software development has evolved all over these years and his current work at h2o.ai his take on the field broadly speaking and the interview of course includes many best advices for all of the beginners out there note that this is a special interview release happening on s2.ai's youtube channel if you want to check out the other interviews the link to the playlist is there in the description another note to the non native english speakers in the audience if you're watching this on youtube this interview along with all of the future interview releases will have checked subtitle so in case you want to enable the subtitle for a better experience please do so these will be proper data science term checked subtitles without further ado it's my privilege to be sharing this interview with dr leland wilkinson with you i hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as i did Hi everyone today I'm really privileged to have on the show a top tier if I may one of the best statisticians of today data scientist as well as creative thinker Dr Leland Wilkinson Dr Leland thank you so much for joining me on the Chai Time Data Science podcast Right thank you So uh today you working as chief scientist at hco.ai if I may you've been involved in the field for over half a century now Could you tell the listeners how you got started? Was it called statistics in your day? Now we call it data science, famously. How has the field evolved? Well, statistics actually has been around. That term has been around for centuries, uh, and statistics came out of. Uh, well, you could read all about it in Steve Stigler's book, The History of Statistics, but it goes way, way back to mm-hmm. at least the 18th century. But Um yes uh <laughs> I guess I should confess I have a rather unorthodox background or the although there are a few people like me in the American Statistical Association I loved mathematics and was going to be majoring in mathematics at Harvard in applied math and I started out I'd done a lot of math in school before Harvard and uh was passionate about it and then just got kind of it was the 60s what can i say <laughs> i decided not long after that to make to switch to english so i could read a bunch of novels and i really and shakespeare and whatever so um, as i graduated i then <laughs> went to divinity school because i at harvard i i did want to be a chaplain in hospitals uh okay. working with people in the hospital And after I got out of divinity school I went into psychology at Yale where I was hoping to continue uh my study of psychology uh, get ordained and become a chaplain and at Yale um I 
just visited the statistics department and started spending my time with friends in the computer center and I was totally hooked. Um, okay. And again, because it was the 60s, um, everybody was out protesting and I actually didn't study much psychology. I spent almost <laughs> all my time in statistics down the street. Okay. And uh, after that, I got a teaching job in Chicago and um, started teaching statistics to psychologists. And so at that point, everything was still statistics, although my mentor in statistics at Yale was John Hardigan, who was a student of John Tukey. And my dissertation advisor was also a student of John Tukey okay. um, at Princeton. And um, we uh, were taught basically from the point of view of data analysis. Tukey, uh, of course, coined the term exploratory data analysis. And then I think another person who had been at Bell Labs and worked closely with Tukey and is one of my heroes, Bill Cleveland, um, coined the word data science. I believe he invented it. Okay. And Bill and, of course, Tukey and even my advisor were against using the word statistics to do what we do, to describe what we do with data. We analyze data in many ways, visually um, and with the computer, with various models. And classical statistics is more about a specific corner of data analysis, a very important one, but um, is not the same as machine learning or data analysis. And so machine learning is a term came out, um, I forget, I have a terrible sense of time, but I think it came out uh, in the early 90s, late 80s, and um, had evolved out of the term data mining, which is kind mm -hmm. of a silly term, I think, but, <laughs> um, and now we call it AI, and yeah. I don't have to give you much information on, we're, we're in the sort of second stage of AI, yeah. where now, as many of us know, uh, we're finding a blending of models such as deep learning, which came out of statistics. That model came out of statistics and psychology. Mm -hmm. um, it's now applied and we're finding out that we get remarkable behavior in prediction or automated cars and so on coming out of these more formal models. So I'm sorry, that was a long description of a history um, but that puts me where I am today. Uh, and I should say I'm very grateful I did have the background uh, that I had because it gave <laughs> me a much broader perspective. Yeah. And I, I don't believe data analysis or statistics is solely about numbers and algebra. It's much broader than that. And it takes an understanding of uh, the role of us in society and uh, you know a larger dimension to appreciate uh, how we should be doing data analysis. That's a great insight. How how was it like working on statistics back in the sixties? Because we didn't have import star from whatever library. So how was working on computers back in the day? Yeah, well, I guess you've already dated me, so I <laughs> feel it. Uh, you know, here I am, and I must say it's thrilling to work at H two O. Uh, because I get to work with uh, young people like you, um, <laughs> Kisi Young. But I will say it was a thrilling time to be working uh, with computers because I started out working at the Yale Computer Center on an IBM uh, 7090 direct coupled system, 7090, 7094, with punch cards. Okay. And we moved to terminals eventually, but I have to say... And you know, uh, in my lifetime, the great revolution occurred when the microcomputer appeared. Uh, yeah. The internet was the second computer revolution uh, in that perspective for data analysis. But I can't tell you how thrilling it was to build a computer. And I bought parts through the mail, from, mostly <laughs> from California. Okay. And we soldered all these parts together. And I built something called a Chromemco which was named after a Stanford University uh, building, actually. Okay. Uh, and I, uh, I just could not believe it. 
I had total control and use of a computer 24 hours a day. Oh. And I actually spend almost 24 hours a day coding that I didn't get much sleep. But I thought, I can't believe it because on the mainframe, you've got this little slice of time and you really couldn't do a whole lot. So for me, that was the great thrill. Uh, that's how I wrote Sysdev. I actually pretty much shut down my mainframe account. Okay. And from that point on, I was writing everything on a microcomputer in several different languages. I had BASIC, Fortran, Lisp. There was even Algol on these tiny computers. This was all before the IBM PC or the Apple. So I had a big head start by building a kit, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the way Bill Gates did. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, uh, uh, but of course, I never quite <laughs> made it. <laughs> there but that's how i got started and it was a thrilling time uh to to be able to be running microcomputers to talk more about your journey you took up the traditional route if i may of completing a bachelor's followed by a master's then a phd why was this route important to you you did your phd in psychology could you tell us more about your research back in the day well actually my interest in psychology quickly segued into uh, what at that time was called mathematical psychology. And back then my heroes were of course, uh, Tukey uh, and uh, uh, Tversky and Kahneman uh, and uh, the people who were doing deep research into perception, a similarity, multidimensional scaling, people like Roger Shepard and Kreskel uh, I was at some of the meetings where multidimensional scaling was actually born. It was pretty thrilling. Um, and my dissertation actually was in the relation between similarities and preferences. Okay. So mathematical models of how we prefer one thing to another. And is that preference based on our judgment of similarity or is it based on a different mechanism? So a lot was happening then at places uh, like UC Irvine, uh, Yale, uh, Michigan, Chapel Hill, by people, pioneers in that area that eventually led to uh, some of the things uh, that Tversky and Kahneman worked on and others. So it was a thrilling time. So throughout your career, another thing that another theme, if I may, I've noticed is you've been always connected to the industry and teaching simultaneously. So first, can you tell us why was being connected uh, to the industry important to you? Even while pursuing your PhD, I believe you were working as a statistical consultant. Yes, I did. Um, yeah, I had a, a, some interesting projects. Uh, uh, one of them was one of the first studies on abortion, early studies back when abortion was illegal in the state of Connecticut, but um, studies on um, uh, children uh, mm -hmm. and their development and so on. So I really got a, a good firsthand experience with, with statistical consulting. I also was in a, uh, a federal trial involving discrimination and uh, that was quite a thrilling uh, experience. Judge Newman was and is a famous federal justice uh, on the federal bench. He, uh, when I testified using a t-test for analyzing these employment discrimination data, he turned to me, it was a bench trial, and he said, did you do a test for heteroscedasticity? <laughs> and I was just blown away. I mean, here is a judge who's, who knows that much about statistics to know that uh, one of the most important things is check your assumptions. Yeah. Um, so being also connected to university, so this is sort of a silly question. As a professor, how have you seen the way of learning evolve over the years? Of course, internet wasn't as big early uh, during your days and now you can almost find any piece of information on the internet. The internet didn't exist back then. 
<laughs> um, actually, I should say the World Wide Web is what really changed the internet. We all know the history, I think, of the internet and how important it was. And yes, um, we, a number of us did uh, some things with our modems and so on before the World Wide Web was uh, invented, yeah. which just uh, suddenly accelerated everything. No, learning has radically changed. I mean, uh, I learned in small groups, uh, seminars and, and small classes in graduate school. Nowadays, as you know, I'm sure many people know uh, that... Um, Silicon Valley and the software industry uh, at the cutting edges is less interested in your pedigrees than what you can actually do. So you don't want to saunter into an interview at Google and say, I went to Harvard or I went to Stanford. <laughs> okay, uh, that might have gotten you a little notice, but what really gets notice is, uh, please walk over to this whiteboard and sketch out for me a depth first search algorithm in, I don't care, Python or something. Yeah. That didn't exist back then at job interviews. And mm -hmm. so um, now in academics, things have not changed quite as much. You still present a talk at yeah. your interviews for, for say a postdoc or assistant professor position and you'll get grilled on your assumptions and <laughs> uh, what you, you know, what you think. And then you'll go, um, you know, to dinner with everyone and uh, they'll give you too much wine and you'll fall asleep. But um, anyway, the, the, the online um, education has been a major change that's given people outside the field, people who didn't go to Stanford or Berkeley or Carnegie in computer science, the chance to learn about data science and actually leverage themselves through internships and so on into some pretty heavy duty positions. And that's, that's a wonderful thing to see. Coming again, back to your journey, when you developed SysStart, can you tell us why was this important to you and uh, how did you find the motivation to actually get started working on it? Uh -huh. Well, actually for my dissertation, I needed uh, a, math, a, a statistical model called the repeated measures analysis of variance in the multivariate layout. And at that point, I had been using SAS, BMD, Data Tech, several programs on the mainframe that have been there, but nobody had the multivariate analysis of variance for repeated measures. So I decided, why don't I write it? Okay. And I did. And um, then, and that, I actually sent that out and a lot of people used it. The deck of cards was about as long as this bookshelf. It was like two, three, 4,000 <laughs> cards uh, okay. with uh, Fortran code. But when I got to Illinois and the computer center there was run by a much more restrictive staff who didn't even want to let faculty anywhere near the computer. Uh, I, and I was able to buy and put together with my consulting income this pretty monstrous microcomputer, which, you know, I was building. <laughs> I decided, oh, let's just take uh, the uh, program, download it from punch cards to my local storage on the microcomputer, which was floppy disks. Mm -hmm. they, they were the big floppy disks. Okay. Uh, so they, were, they were like a megabyte per disk. So I was able to put the whole thing on there. And then I thought, hey, I could actually write a little statistics package. And I think I kind of went crazy. I'm sure a number <laughs> of you have had that experience where you start coding at nine in the morning and at 10 at night, <laughs> you, and you realize, what happened to today? <laughs> was, was it raining outside? I have no idea. And I, I just was on a roll. And I, I wrote, uh, oh, hundreds of thousands of lines of code. Uh, by now, I think I've probably written a million lines of, of uh, production code that people actually use. <laughs> uh, we don't talk as much nowadays about lines of code because... Yeah some bad programmers generate tons of it. 
uh, and a beautiful program isn't necessarily a long one. But what I'm saying is if you've been doing this continuously, I would say literally every day of the year, I've had my hands on a keyboard for the last almost 50 years. Yes, you, you do begin to uh, accumulate a lot, of, a lot of code. The other thing is, the colleagues who are my age or even younger, because, uh, uh, you know, say full professors, by the time they get into departments or companies where they've done all their research and written lots of code back then, they haven't got time. They're too busy writing grants yeah. and organizing grad students or doing running large projects at places like Google. So they stop writing code uh, and... Uh, even this morning, I was sitting here writing a ton of Java code to get some stuff done. Mm -hmm. And I, I've never stopped coding. I love coding. It's just, it's fun. <laughs> if I may ask this naive question, what keeps you so passionate even at you 75 young? What keeps you so passionate even, even at this age? Well, they, you finally said it, my age. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had to ask that question. <laughs> Now, honestly, I think the, the most significant things in my life, are obviously, after my family and my life here, are coding and exciting new challenges. And then lastly, working with young people. Because one of the things uh, people my age who have been in computers often do is they reminisce and they say, you know, like these young whippersnappers, um, don't understand, we wrote in Fortran, or <laughs> like, we wrote in C. Yeah, well, you know what? Uh, if you aren't learning from a 20-something, you know, a 22-year-old, uh, what's happening today, you're not gonna go anywhere. And that's what's pretty much driven me over the years, is having the chance to get advice from people who are about the, <laughs> the age of my granddaughter. That's very inspiring. Coming to <laughs> software development uh, in in the early 80s, can you tell us what was your favorite developments in software development over the years in open source or otherwise? Well, there, there. I actually was tempted to put Sysdat into open source. Uh, okay. I'd already had some competitors copying parts of the program and so on. But I was really a little bit at that time before the growth of the open source, source movement. You know, Richard Stallman and, and the, all the mechanisms needed to really let open source take off. Yeah. Um, I would say R was probably, certainly in statistics, the mm. first emergence of that phenomenon. And that had to do partly with how AT&T mishandled S, where, which was developed by John Chambers and Rick Becker and other, Bill Cleveland and other people at the labs. So um, I sort of spanned that open source movement. I have written a bunch of our packages now, uh, and that's been a lot of fun. Um, so there, it, it, open source now is facing some significant challenges. And I think some of that, not to get too political about it, but some of it does have to do with the large corporations that are busy buying up every other startup in the world. And yeah. everything is getting sucked into about five mega corporations. And the problem then is that those mega corporations are using tons of open source software and it's getting more and more difficult for startups and little groups of people to uh, get the support they need to develop uh, yeah. new code. Yeah. But I feel like definitely the general open sourcing has been beneficial overall speaking for the society and even oh, I think for yeah. the industry speaking. Oh, it's a revolution. Now, there's no question. Um, it, it's made a huge difference. I mean, I think if you just look at the you can't actually compare sales figures because naturally open source is free. Yeah. But if you actually look at the number of users, it has eclipsed all the other statistics packages in terms of the number of users. Uh, it, it's just been a major change. Mm -hmm. 
Now, coming to another aspect that you've contributed to, you quite literally authored and set the path for the grammar of graphics, without which we wouldn't have ggplot, Python bokeh, and even Tableau, I think. Could you tell us what led you to authoring the book and essentially becoming, if I may, the father of modern visualizations? Well, I'll go, I'll go a little bit into that. Uh when I came to SPSS, they had asked me to do visualization okay. uh, because they had been using third-party software that was just not living up to SPSS's reputation. Anyway, I spent some time there and, and s- sort of ran into roadblocks from what I will say would be sort of third level of the bureaucracy where the managers were threatened by the recommendations I was making. Okay. And <laughs> um, I have, I still have many friends from SPSS, so I don't mean to cast dispersions. It's been, a, it was a magnificent place to be, but I will say there was a meeting in which I said, look, I'm trying to tell you how do you do this stuff? And if you don't want to listen to me, I'll just write a book and show the world how to do it. <laughs> um, and I left the meeting, and that was also, by the way, I, I'm sorry, I shouldn't go too far into this, but I was asked by some people at SPSS, how did you ever code so much? We can't believe how, you know, Sysdat, uh in the mid-80s, you, you released this ton of graphics software. And I said, I never went to meetings. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so... I'm not a very good organization man, to put it, you know, in context of them. Uh, and so much as I appreciate, I got tremendous support from the CEO of SPSS, Jack Noonan. And he said, don't you worry about this stuff. Just go ahead and do what you're doing. So okay. I put together a team of about seven people, people like Dan Rope and Graham Wills and Roger Dubs and, and uh, Andy Norton and so on. These were brilliant uh, and really uh, productive people. And what happened was uh, I had been, as I started to think about coding in Java, these things, uh, along with Graham and Dan and so on, uh, and and Dan was an inspiration. He had come from the Bureau of Labor Statistics and already had written quite a few graphics. I realized there was a grammar here. And it was related to the grammar of experimental design, which if you're in that technical area in statistics, you know there are concepts that um, are quite mathematical, de-optimal designs and design algebra and so on. And so I put all this stuff together and we started coding it. A lot of the architecture was similar to Sysdats. Um, okay where I had written a ton of code to do millions of different kinds of graphics. But we had some thrilling moments when uh, the grammar we would code, Dan Rope and I, for example, sat for a week struggling with something called a scatterplot matrix. And I said, I know this object can be made with the algebra. And suddenly one day I said, I know it's a quadratic form, which is what we have when we do in matrices X transpose X, and we make a correlation matrix. And here, let's do it with objects, with graphical objects. And I couldn't believe it. Dan typed into his program the algebra we worked out and out popped a scatterplot matrix. We never wrote a scatterplot matrix. Okay. And many of the other graphics we never wrote, they were a, an aspect of the algebra. And I think uh, that's what led, uh, probably one of the first people was Hadley Wickham at Iowa State when he was a graduate student working with Di Cook, a f- fantastic statistician there who's now actually back in Melbourne. Uh, and he realized this himself. So he developed the ggplot system, which implemented, I'd say about three quarters of what's in the book, Mm -hmm. but just very elegantly, and it just took off. And of course, the other one was Tableau, where Pat Hanrahan and Chris Dolte uh, implemented uh, not just the algebra, but the UI that I outlined in the book. And it's very, very close 
to the way Tableau looks uh, today. Um, okay. So, did you anticipate uh, the book to set off so many uh, ripples into the stats world, so to speak, or was uh, it a surprise well, to you? I wrote it as a monograph, so I literally <laughs> thought of it as a journal article, but I uh, it wouldn't fit into a typical journal. So I picked Springer uh, because they were a math publisher and I thought they gave me the license to go ahead and lay out all the math in there and not feel inhibited by page length and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I basically took almost no royalties um, and thought, I hope grad students and professors will see this. But I told my editor, you know what, the sales are going to really be terrible the first year <laughs> and the second year maybe a few more. And I said, I expect the sales to increase every year. And he was pretty nonplussed. <laughs> it was <just> like, <laughs> increase? I mean, normally you get this burst of sales, right? And yeah. then they begin to fade off. But actually every year, the sales have continued to increase. Uh, now it's, I don't mean it's selling, uh, you know, like um, your latest, hottest novel or even, or, or even a book like Hasty Friedman and Tip Shirani which is sort of the Bible of the machine learning movement. But it's, it's sold quite well. And most important to me is uh, it is recognized among the people I most admire. And those people are at, you know, they're at Microsoft, Google, yeah. Facebook. They're, they're, they're the people who do visualization and don't just read a book but actually are the people who have to code to do visualization. And now there's, there's an explosion now of beautiful mm -hmm. new visualization techniques and programs. Yeah. Coming to your current day job now, you're the chief scientist at S2O.ai. Can you tell us what does a, in your current job, current life look like as at S2O, quite a few of projects are happening, both open source and otherwise, what all tasks are you currently involved in? Most of my work is in visualization, of course, at H2O. Uh, AutoViz was a component of driverless AI that I wrote um, uh, uh, as a server uh, side uh, library. And then Jan Gametz, or Johnny as we call him, and uh, Justin, who is now in the uh, PwC group, uh, and uh, Basically, and Alexi, who uh, is the sort of person supervising the data table for DAI. Anyway, they hooked it all up, mm -hmm. and that's been pretty thrilling. That's, that's been a project where you look at data and you say, can I do some visualizations before I have any model in mind? And can I learn something from those visualizations before I start to imagine models that I'll implement. Um, more recently, I'm working on what started as the Q, the quantum project. It's now Q, it's in development, mm -hmm. and it's, it's very exciting. Uh, and uh, it's an exploratory anal visualization analysis package, again, to go alongside of DAI, driverless AI. And what's uh, exciting for me with that project especially is I moved back to Chicago to be near my daughter and her family uh, here in Chicago. And um, much as I loved California, um, th this gave me the chance to sort of enlarge my life and be back with friends. And I discovered that I can work very productively like this using Zoom, mm -hmm. WebEx, whatever. Um, and we have one meeting. I tell people out here that they're astounded because everyone knows you can do video conferencing or just, you know, iPhone, FaceTime, so on. But I say, we get together every Monday. One person's in Singapore, one's in Bangalore, one's in LA, one's in Mountain View, one's in Chicago. <laughs> like all having a meeting as if we were in Mountain View. So I know it's a cliche, but yeah. going through the experience every week of doing that and getting stuff done is, is pretty thrilling. Now, when I mentioned Dan Rope, 
uh, he and I back at SPSS, uh, he was located in Washington, D.C., and I was in Chicago. And we did the same thing using an early pre-beta copy of, uh, I've forgotten the name. It was a, a conferencing program that Microsoft was working on that they bought the team for. Okay. And that's when I first discovered, oh, boy, working, you know, with a, with a sketchboard, uh, with video and so on, you can get actually more done than you would if you were in the office by the water cooler. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah. Coming to, uh, you mentioned AutoViz. Uh, can you tell us why is AutoViz, auto visualization important to auto ML, automated machine learning? Isn't the purpose of auto ML to completely replace the human? Where does AutoViz come into the picture then? Um, good, good question. And no, that's not the focus of it, but that's really, um, uh, it will not, and I personally believe uh, AI is never going to replace uh, the full range of human perception, reasoning, and so on, uh, because we, we are incredible brain machines. We know that, but we also have bodies, and that gives us the wisdom of the environment that machine learning doesn't really have, and probably, in my opinion, is not going to have for a long time. <laughs> but AutoViz is designed to handle extremely large data sets where we could not sit down with a program like, uh, oh, I won't name them, but there's some very good statistics packages that allow you to open a data set, do a scatter plot, look at histograms, but uh, for example, today I'm looking at a data set that's a microarray data set. It has 800 rows by 20,000 columns. You cannot physically do scatter plots on 20,000 C2, you know, yeah. uh, different scatter. You, you couldn't do them. So the point of AutoViz is to let machine learning algorithms and statistical algorithms go through there and say, you know, you should take a look at this. And this might be 50 scatter plots, but it's not an impossibly large number of scatter plots. <laughs> um, and the second thing about AutoViz is it uses models and methods that are not classical statistical. They are more, they're closer and inspired by Tukey's work, where instead of looking at skewness, the classical estimate that estimator that involves cubing numbers. Um, mm -hmm. I look at uh, other kinds of more recent measures of skewness that are based on means and medians and so on that um, allow you to look, uh, uh, to do away with some of the assumptions that were overly rigid in classical statistics. So all of this I view as a a platform for helping people get an initial look at data. Mm -hmm. now, I did write a program which um, unfortunately got buried uh, because of a mistake I made with a, a startup before H2O. But anyway, it was a program that I called a second opinion that actually took your models and you fit a model like a regression model or a uh, classification model or clustering, and it would do the same analysis you did using a package like SAS or, or R. And I would then think about the problem the way Tukey would think about it. Like, look at the residuals. Do you find unusual patterns in the residuals? He, he used to call it the the uh, smooth plus rough or the fit plus uh, residual. And uh, I would deliver up documents that would indicate whether you were justified in keeping that model uh, or you needed to refine it. Nowadays in machine learning, of course, we have automated procedures that will do Things similar to that, and we all, at least a lot of machine learning people I know, don't even care <laughs> about distributions and whatever. They say, and I think they're profoundly wrong, but they say, oh, the machine can do a better job than people can. 
uh, in fitting these models. And so just leave it up to them. I've had questions as in audiences where mm -hmm. people will say, you know, computer scientists will say, well, what's the point of visualization? Because the machine can do it better than we can. And I say, no, that's wrong. That's false. <laughs> um, you can give counterexamples where the machine will simply miss patterns uh, because the models the machine is using weren't written or devised by people who are very familiar with data analysis. And, okay. and there, there's a problem, I think, in some machine learning circles today that hinges around comments uh, that George Box, a famous statistician, made. Uh, but you've heard these comments before. If uh, uh, you know everything's a nail, your hammer is going to be your solution for yeah. for. Uh, and, and that's the opposite of what people like Tukey did. You, you don't take a model, throw it at data, and then get a prediction, and now you're done. Got it. Uh, again, since you made it clear that you're on the side of humans in the AI loop, can you tell even or elaborate a bit on where does Autovis come into the auto ML picture? Like what all portions of the auto ML pipeline are being dealt with using Autovis? Well, actually, we're getting a, a lot of requests from company, uh, companies that um, can Autovis enhance auto ML. Um, and give us the ability to improve those models automatically without people even looking at the graphs. And the auto ML uh, at H2O was originally in effect called auto DL, which was named after Dmitry Larko, this brilliant Russian okay. <laughs> uh, computer scientist at H2O. Um, I, I don't think I'm divulging any trade secret here, uh, but um, uh, everyone not at HRO, keep your hands off Dimitri, he's brilliant. Um, <laughs> anyway, my point here is that Dimitri devised this way of adding features to uh, models, which he was a pioneer. Now everybody talks about feature engineering and so on. Well, H2O was doing this several years ago. Yeah. And I've talked with Dimitri about of some of the Tukey transformations that I do in Autoviz, which are called by Tukey re-expressions, um, to do things like symmetrize a distribution. And actually, Dimitri has already implemented some of that right inside DAI. Okay. It turns out it's not widely known, for example, by machine learning people that if you do some transformations like log a predictor variable, Models like decision trees or random forests or gradient boosting machines don't care because they don't care about the shape of the distribution. But actually, they do care if you transform the dependent variable because often the loss functions are calculated in ways that involve computing sums of squares or other statistics that are different on a log scale than they are on the raw uh, scale. Yes. So that's one of the areas where we've already incorporated in DAI some of the things that are done inside Autoviz itself. Got it. Another is, is outliers, uh, although that's a very tricky area in modeling because generally statisticians don't like to remove outliers unless you know they were caused by some artifact. Mm -hmm. Uh, in, in my book, uh, The Grammar of Graphics, I uh, relate a favorite story from American Sociological Review where uh, people, a, a, a researcher was modeling the frequency of sexual coitus, I guess, in married couples over 50 years old. And the estimate came up to be Absolutely huge. Obviously, the author wasn't over 50 years old. But uh, the point was, the estimate was just wrong. There was an outlier. Yeah. And the outlier was caused by uh, an SPSS convention for coding, which some of you might remember, that 
uh, on the old IBM machines and so on. There wasn't a special missing value code. SAS actually implemented one, which was uh, solved this particular problem. Anyway, the code was 999. So you had a few people <laughs> in the data who were having intercourse 999 times a month. <laughs> that, that tended to drag up the estimate. Now, my point here is that in outliers in data analysis, by all means, delete them if you know why they occurred. But if somebody's just an outlier because it's a very big number in the data, uh, you better think twice about uh, deleting them. And often statisticians uh, make uh, robust models which yep. can downweight those outliers without completely deleting them. That's great insight. Now, uh, asking you another insider question, if you could maybe give us some insider view of what we call the maker culture. What are your thoughts on the maker and makers are going to make philosophy as we call it at H2? It's really interesting. And I, I think I have to credit uh, uh, Sri, our founder, uh, yeah. Sri Ambadi, with uh, this idea and you know, it resembles in some way the way Jack Noonan at SPSS treated me and other people. And that is he gave you a very long leash. Uh, I told you that story about how I was just getting bureaucratically tied down by all sorts of rules and regulations. And Jack said, <laughs> don't worry about it. Do your thing, just make software. And that's what Shri does. It's interesting. These products, at least as long as I've been there, which is, I think, almost four years, um, emerged from these people, uh, these makers at H2O mm -hmm. without any strong hand guidance from marketing and sales. Now, Everyone pays attention to marketing and sales, and we have some dynamite people running those groups. But, yeah. um, but those are after you get the basic software idea in place, and then you start asking customers, what do you think, and what would you like to see? As opposed to the old-fashioned waterfall method of development that you know about, <laughs> where you write a 100-page Microsoft Word document with every single risk requirement. Mm -hmm. And uh, engineers, as you know, just hate this because they're, <laughs> being, they're being treated like trolls, you know, just um, do that or, or, you know, code monkeys, <laughs> that term. Mm -hmm. And so H2O is very different. Now I can cite some amazing things. Uh, I did some, for example, some work in, uh, producing HTML documents, reports that uh, came out of a second opinion to describe a statistical analysis. And when I got to H2O, uh, a, a small group of people there, uh, uh, one of them was uh, Megan, who uh, has worked a lot in data analysis, sort of thought, can we do auto doc? Mm -hmm. and now, SAS had done something like this very early and very innovatively in the, I think, 1980s to, um, yeah. to expand their output with explanations and so on. But I'm just saying nobody asked her to do this, uh, you know, and say, here's exactly what you have to do. The same, as I said, with, uh, with um, DAI, and mm -hmm. uh, Dimitri uh, doing that kind of stuff. I, I could name three or four examples of projects inside the company that just emerged because someone had a crazy idea <laughs> and they tell Sri, and he said, yeah, work with it, uh, go with it. So I don't know how typical, I've been to only one other startup where that surely didn't happen and they went bankrupt. But I think that's what's unusual in my experience with H2O. Got it. Now, uh, zooming out a bit, can you speak a bit about how has the hype or industry changed over the years as we went from 
statistical statistics being the famous word to machine learning to data science to ai now how has the hype and industry changed over the years just the way you described it uh, <laughs> these terms last about 2 years um the thing is data science that term that bill cleveland coined uh has now resulted in the founding at some top notch places columbia michigan and so on berkeley in data science programs so you're not going to see that term go away as fast as some of these others but you know i do remember going to a few years ago strata which mm-hmm. is an industry conference it's not really like nips or american statistical meeting but back then you know people were going around going kadu 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 and as if that solved every problem in machine learning yeah. and uh yes a dupe is still there but uh you know um we now have distributed systems that are far more powerful and so you can expect these things uh will be replaced every 6 months to a year a lot of these mm-hmm. terms um so um and by the way at least to the extent of my psychology training i i think the way ai is being used today is is really a misnomer uh anybody who thinks the brain looks like a deep learning structure doesn't understand the brain I, and i've had a number of friends who work in that area of research you know and a lot of psychology departments have basically turned into mri departments but no ai the way we use it today uh is basically an extension of statistical models i think uh, uh, most people know that virtually every procedure we use in uh what we call ai today was invented by a statistician. Yeah. Uh if you read Hasty Freeman Tipsharani, you'll get a good idea of the history and uh how that that works. So even deep learning basically <laughs> came out of psychological research in the 1960s. Yeah. Some engineering research, but these models were used to explain human speech and so on and they've turned out to be very powerful, but they are not models of the brain the brain doesn't work that way so anyway some day actually this may happen it may be one of the great new steps in ai when when models start incorporating this is sort of like ensembles but but hi- different in that it's hierarchical the brain is very hierarchical in the vision system and the auditory system and so on and if these deep learning models get integrated into a more general hierarchical system we might start seeing the kinds of processing that will enable uh much higher levels of behavior not just you know training cats pictures so. <laughs> yeah. that's true now the next question is by uh, russ wolfinger what do you see what do you oh, foresee uh, <laughs> <laughs> i don't know if he's a uh, on now but uh oh, he's a, he's a great guy really fine statistician at he fact, he was really excited about the ama section so he sent this question to the ama uh-huh. and <laughs> what do you foresee for the future of open source stats versus uh, and gr- graphical software and i think this is a tricky one how about python versus r as the future of it <laughs> well oh that's a touchy question <laughs> No, you know, in general I think people who've coded in Python and R uh, uh understand why there are now two communities. Uh I don't think either one will uh become the standard for machine learning. I think you got to have both. Mm-hmm. Uh if uh, briefly to summarize, I would say you pick Python generally for data munging. although if you do leverage some of the things that Hadley Wickham has done in the tidyverse and so on you can do some pretty impressive things in R but mm-hmm. um in my estimation python is going to continue to be 
uh, and partly through the support of Google, <laughs> uh, uh, is going to continue to be uh, a leading data munging language environment. Also, um, as you know, uh, uh, Python can get Scythonized, so the performance of it can be pretty much as good as Java or C++. Mm -hmm. R, if you're going to do a uh, hierarchical nonlinear model uh, with, I don't know, it's a few more qualifications, there is no place other than R you can go because that one was developed by the professor who invented that model. <laughs> so, I mean, and uh, actually another system, uh, Stata, which is sort of in classical econometric statistics areas, um, is where you're going to choose if you have certain types of econometric models and you want to go to the horse's mouth, that's where it is. <laughs> so um, I don't much like uh, software bigots, you know, the, the, you know, people bragging about how oh, object oriented is dead and we need functional <laughs> programming or this or that or JavaScript. You know, I really don't care. Mm -hmm. uh, the real issue is the algorithms you're using and what you plan to do with them. And you can code it in Fortran even. I don't care. But, um, but I do think R and Python are going to continue to thrive. Uh, there's no question the growth in those two areas is uh, phenomenal. Mm -hmm. uh, personally, uh, I just, I, I'm still in a Java world. I, it took me 10 years to learn object-oriented <laughs> design and Java programming. And when I read blogs about how object-oriented is dead, I, I notice that the people who are talking about that have probably spent about a year trying to learn what all of that is about. But uh, those people aren't Josh Block or, you know, real experts in object-oriented <laughs> design. So uh, I just feel very comfortable in Java. It's just a very clean language from my point of view. Mm -hmm. And what do you foresee as the future of open source stats and uh, graphical software? Uh, well, I mean, I, I think, uh, uh, for example, there are projects going on right now in China by mm -hmm. Alipay, you know, related to Alibaba, and so that are uh, involve open source grammar or graphics coding in JavaScript, of all things. And uh, they're making great progress. So... Uh, I think um, open source is going to continue uh, to thrive. Uh, I did read this morning in the New York Times a very troubling article on the relation between open source and the big, what used to be called the FANG companies, but in this case it was about Amazon. And we use Amazon, I use AWS all the time. It's a magnificent, huge cloud platform Mm -hmm. But some of what I read about how they have incorporated open source and in so doing basically destroyed the little company that was <laughs> making that open source uh, okay. is very troubling. And uh, uh, I, I don't know where that's going to go. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing about open source that some people don't realize, I think most people know, it, it costs. Somebody pays for it. Um, yeah. Now, I, I wrote Sysdat on a sabbatical, but I couldn't have done that if I weren't a professor, um, mm -hmm. you know, with the comfort of knowing that um, my life wasn't depending on whether Sysdat, you know, earned anything. Um, and most places where open source is happening today, places like our studio and so on, those people are paid. So they're developing some commercial uh, applications, but at the same time, they have the license to write the open source. That's a very delicate situation. And if the large companies don't realize, and some of them do realize, but I mean, if they don't realize that this delicate ecosystem depends on everybody treating each other with respect, uh, open source is gonna be stifled 
mm-hmm. uh, we'll see. Just yeah. a concern. This has been a great interview. My final question to you would be: What would be your best advice to someone who's just getting started in the field of machine learning, uh, broadly speaking? Um, code, 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 code. <laughs> Do an internship. Uh, it's tough to get, uh, you know, full-time jobs uh, nowadays, uh, especially in academics in this area. But just uh, get involved and code. Uh, it's like in mathematics, the mathematicians I talk to, and my daughter's a mathematician, um, you're not doing math unless you do proofs. You can't read a math book and just say, oh, I get it. No, you've got to <laughs> do proofs. Well, in machine learning, you've got to code in R, Python, and you can't run them like a stat package, you know, like the way we used to pick up SAS or SPSS or something and write three or four lines of commands or, or more, and then say, oh, I just did a regression. That's not data analysis. Um, nowadays, uh, you can pick up SAS and write code in SAS to do real data analysis, but uh, you have to think creatively. And uh, in fact, that's how people like Russ uh, became Kaggle champions. So yes, code, code, code. That's in my <laughs> view is the answer. And when you run into trouble, yeah, go to Stack Overflow or wherever. Be aware that there's a lot of misinformation in those places, but uh, you will learn a tremendous amount if you are actively coding. That's that's great advice. Thank you so much again, Dr. Leland, for joining me on the podcast and on behalf of the community for all of your huge contributions to the complete community, if I may. Well, thank you very much. I enjoyed the chance. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed the show, please be sure to give it a review or feel free to shoot me a message. You can find all of the social media links in the description. If you like the show, please subscribe and tune in each week to Chai Time Data Science.